Welcome to Learning Thursdays. I'm Dean Hale with the OASIS Learning and Development Unit and your host for today's presentation. Today's presentation is titled Synthetic Cannabinoids, and our presenter is Dr. Pamela Mund, Associate Chief of Addiction Medicine for New York State OASIS. She will be joining us in just a moment, but first, a word about Learning Thursdays. Learning Thursdays are offered to behavioral health professionals as a free learning opportunity with the goal of improving the knowledge and skills of the New York State Substance Use Disorder Workforce as we strive to improve the lives of individuals needing prevention, treatment, recovery, and harm reduction services. A goal of Learning Thursdays is to support the professional development of the treatment, preventional, recovery, and harm reduction workforce. We do this by offering regular presentations that are relevant to today's substance use disorder treatment professional. As always, if there are any questions, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to contact us at the Learning Thursdays mailbox. You can use the same mailbox to express an interest in providing a future Learning Thursdays program. And now it's time to start the presentation and welcome Dr. Mund. Thanks, Dean. So today we're gonna to be talking about synthetic cannabinoids as Dean mentioned. So the objectives of today's discussion are to introduce the novel psychoactive substances, otherwise known as NPSs, talk about synthetic cannabinoids as a type of NPS. We'll discuss and just introduce the history of synthetic cannabinoids, its epidemiology, some of the clinical effects, and then we'll move into closing with discussion of harm reduction as it relates to the synthetic cannabinoids. So something about the classification and definitions. So the synthetic cannabinoids are actually one of the groups of novel psychoactive substances. And the psychoactive substances defined are a group of chemically diverse compounds that are designed to be lookalikes. They're, they're designed to mimic the actions of already established recreational substances or drugs like the cannabinoids, stimulants, opioids, hallucinogens, and sedatives like benzodiazepines. The term new refers to those substances that are recently, when we're talking about like in the last 20 years, and more rapidly emerging into the recreational drug market. And in fact, they may be actually uh, substances that may be already had existed in the past and have been repurposed for other from other pharmaceuticals. These substances are marketed worldwide as illicitly as legal highs, bath salts, or research chemicals, just to name a few terms. There are some health risks that are known from about the synthetic cannabinoids and novel psychoactive substances, but many of the health risks are yet unknown and the societal harms as a whole are still really unknown. As I mentioned, there are different groups of psychoactive, no, novel psychoactive substances. The first one, as I mentioned, is synthetic cannabinoids, also the synthetic opioids, stimulants, designer benzodiazepines and other sedatives, the dissociatives and hallucinogens. And from the uh, data from the UN Office of, on Drugs and Crime World Report 2022, synthetic cannabinoids represented 28%, that was down from 39% of all the novel psychoactive substances. Let's take a closer look at the cannabinoids. These substances are really a structurally diverse group of chemicals, so not just one type of chemical. And in particular, they target the, the body's endocannabinoid system, and this is the body's own naturally occurring cannabis cannabinoid system. And these substances are designed to mimic the main ingredient in cannabis, otherwise known as Delta 9 THC or THC as everyone knows it. The effects resemble, but in fact are much more intense and much more variable and of shorter duration than THC is. It's estimated potency, you can find um, literature showing that it's up to two to 800 times more potent than naturally occurring cannabis. So that's a big range. Commonly, um, common terms are spice and K2. They're pretty well-recognized brands. 
let's move on to some data about NPSs and synthetic cannabinoids. So these novel psychoactive substances are not just in the US, they are worldwide. And this is a, a slide from, the, again, from the UN Office of Drugs and Crime Early Warning Advisory. This is a map of the world showing how distributed these substances are throughout the world. And in the darker, the dark purple is the United States. And the United States does, has reported the highest concentration of novel psychoactive substances. As of December 2022, more than 500 NPS novel psychoactive substances have been identified in the U.S. Worldwide, 138 countries have re uh, reported these substances. And in total, 1,182 substances were reported globally to the UNODC from the same organization, the UNODC. These are categories of NPSs sold in the, on the market by effect group. And, and again, looking at data up to December 2022, look at percentages of each of these substances, these novel psychoactive substances, the top, this is again worldwide, the top substance reported was, were stimulants, the synthetic stimulants at 33%, followed by the synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists, 28%, followed by hallucinogens, opioids, other sedatives, and then dissociatives. So worldwide, stimulants is number one, and the synthetic cannabinoids are number two. And this is a, a table, this is a, or a dashboard from the UNODC that's a pretty useful site that anybody can go to. One can choose the substance you're interested in examining. And here I, I, I brought up synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists. And in this report, we see that from 2013 to 2023, 84 countries had reported 337 synthetic cannabinoids in this time period. And you do, we do see that the trend in 2022 was a decline and then for the early part of 2023, a further decline. Okay, something of the history of synthetic cannabinoids. So these substances have actually been around for a little while now. They were first developed in the 1960s and the 1970s by researchers who were looking um, for medicinal treatments for cancer-related pain and other inflammatory conditions. In the following decade, in the 1980s, medical researchers further developed these synthetic can cannabinoids and, and developed uh, three novel prototypes, and in addition, located the synthetic um, cannabinoid receptor. And the three original series you would uh, refer to as HU from Hebrew University, CP from Pfizer, and the W, excuse me, the JWH series by J.W. Huffman. By the next decade, uh, clandestine manufacturers began illicit, illicitly synthesizing some of these compounds and distributing them for illegal use across the internet. And you might see this term hijacking these by these Asian internet labs, this term hijacking. Uh, by the next decade, 2005 to 2008, these substances appeared in the United States or were reported to appear in the United States. And by 2011, the DEA had scheduled the first group of these substances. In 2020, excuse me, in 2012, 15 substances were scheduled in category one. By 2020, 43 synthetic cannabinoids were scheduled one by the DEA. And there's a few more that have or will be uh, soon to be scheduled this coming year, I anticipate. In the following decade, 20, 2009 to 2019, the synthetic cannabinoids dominated the NPS market. Since 2019, synthetic cannabinoid reports have actually declined, but this is probably really unreliable as the substances are constantly evolving and evading detection. So we really don't know what's happening. I'm going to move into talking about some chemistry and pharmacology of the synthetic cannabinoids. So let's just start by defining a little bit better what is a, a cannabinoid, because we hear the term cannabis, cannabinoid in the news and the media, 
and I just wanted to define it a little more clearly. So a cannabinoid is any chemical substance and naturally or is synth or a synthetic interacts with the body's cannabinoid receptors. And there are two types of cannabinoid receptors called CB1 and CB2. There are three general types of cannabinoids, those that occur naturally in the human or animal body. They're called the endocannabinoids. There's also the cannabinoids that occur in the cannabis plant, the phytocannabinoids. Uh, where THC comes from, and then there are the synthetic cannabinoids, those that are, that are chemically engineered in laboratories, and that those are the synthetic cannabinoids we, we're going to be discussing. So to understand what synthetic cannabinoids is, to understand what they are not, and synthetic cannabinoids are not the same as natural cannabis, and they are not synthetic cannabis. The term, as I said, synthetic cannabis really is inaccurate. It's a misnomer. It's more appropriate to call these substances synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists. In particular, these substances are agonists at these, again, the CB1 and CB2 receptors, but in particular, they really go for the CB1. They activate the CB1 receptor. Those are the main ones that are involved with all the effects from, C, from synthetic cannabinoids. These substances rarely represent a, a vast array of formulations. There's probably more than, more than 280 very complex formulations. And this structural complexity permits multiple chemical modifications constantly, which increases the diversity of these substances for the real purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, of evading drug control. And there are many, many, many very complicated long names that also create a lot of confusion for those that are monitoring these substances. Now, these, again, these substances, the synthetic cannabinoids, interact in the, with the receptors as what we said, are, they are full agonists. And as full agonists, they have the greatest type of effect. That's in the purple line. In the green line below, we see how THC, and that's the active ingredient in cannabis, interacts with the receptors as a, what's called a partial agonist. And as a partial agonist, there is a lesser effect. It's not as intense. And I'm gonna liken this to methadone, which is a full agonist versus buprenorphine, which is a partial agonist. On the left, we see cannabis, as a partial agonist interacting with that CB1 receptor. On the, on the right, we see the synthetic cannabinoids interacting with the receptor as a full agonist. And one of the main differences, and you see this in the picture, is that the cannabis also has something called cannabidiol, and the synthetic cannabinoids lack cannabidiol. And cannabidiol has the, the, the effect to block some of the impact of the THC, it really acts as an antagonist to lessen the intensity of the, of the substance. Mainly, the synthetic cannabinoids have the effect, again, at the CB1 receptor. Synthetic cannabinoids pharmacology. So there are many factors that impact how a person may experience a substance. It's dose, meaning how strong it is, its composition, how it's made up. The person who's using it may impact the experience. And finally, the route that the person uses the substance can impact its effect. So in particular, when synthetic cannabinoids are smoked, it's rapidly absorbed into the body, through the lungs, then into the bloodstream, and then it's distributed throughout the body with effects seen and um, felt within five minutes. So it's pretty quick. By mouth, the absorption is much more, it's slower and much more variable. There's not that much, there are not that many reports about injecting synthetic cannabinoids. So we don't know too much about it. We think it's rare and we don't really know the impact. The substance, these substances are metabolized rather quickly and then eliminated from the body through the kidneys. Interestingly, the synthetic cannabinoids have metabolites that may hang around, may remain in the urine for a really long time beyond its beyond the 
primary use. And versus cannabis, these metabolites really can still maintain some activity and meaning that they still can have effects. And we don't really know the role of these effects or the impact that they have on the body. And it, it is possible that some of the metabolites can be toxic as they change into different substances. Now we're gonna talk about how the synthetic cannabinoids are processed, produced, and marketed. So the synthetic cannabinoids have to be formulated. They, these chemicals start off in a powdered form that have to be dissolved in an organic solvent. And two solvents used commonly are acetone and methanol. Once it's dissolved in these, the solvent, the solvent, the liquid, is then sprayed or soaked onto dried plant material, typically herbs like lemon balm, mint, or thyme. Commonly, the small bottles of the dissolved synthetic cannabinoids may be shipped directly in that form to avoid customs detection, and they are labeled not for human consumption. They may be sold on the internet or typically sold, in fact, on the internet or otherwise known as a black web directly to consumers. They may be sm um, sold in smoke shops or gas stations as incense or potpourri and again, marketed as legal highs or legal alternatives to marijuana. They come in really attractive packaging, mainly targeting youth and young adults. And highlighted in red here, again, that there really is no quality control. You know, these substances are marketed illicitly and there's no oversight. There's no authority that's looking to make sure these substances are safe. The herbal mixtures even themselves may contain many unknown chemicals like bath salts, synthetic cathinones, stimulants, ecstasy, or other toxins. And even when in the same brand or the same uh, package, the contents are really highly variable. And even within the same package, there are different uh, spots in the package where there's more concentrated drug than the other spots. The person who uses synthetic cannabinoids usually smokes or vapes the product, but they also can ingest, ingest it as a tablet, powder, or tea. Here are some photos of the formulations of synthetic cannabinoids. On the upper left, see the packet of the white powder, label not for human consumption, and a long chemical name. In the next slide, the, the dissolved powder is in the spray bottle and is being sprayed on the plant material. In the third, uh, photo, we see someone who's roll uh, has a some rolling paper and has the has opened the package and rolling the this the synthetic cannabinoids into a smokable form. In the bottom left, you see a package of a K2 purple haze next to it. It's in a little jar and a close up view on the bottom right of what the plant material looks like. Looks like a bunch of herbs. Synthetic cannabinoids are marketed under many, many names. Some of just, these are very few names, but there's probably myriads. It's Spice Gold, Spice Silver, Spice Diamond, K2, Bliss, Black Mamba, Bombay Blue, Blaze, Genie, Chronic, Mr. Smiley, etc. This is from the Department of Health website, New York State Department of Health in 2015, so a few years ago, but these are some examples of packaging. And as you can see, they look like candy wrappers, Scooby snacks, cartoons, um, very attractive and in particular attractive to younger, to adolescents and young adults. Now we're gonna move into talking about some of the patterns of synthetic cannabinoid use. So mostly the teens and young adults are using the synthetic cannabinoids people who identify as male more than those who identify as female. The majority of people who use synthetic cannabinoids also have used or are using cannabis. So that's pretty important to note. And I, I'd say that the prevalence estimates generally are very unreliable. And again, the substances are constantly evolving. And when there's a sh really short window of detection, so after, after somebody takes the substance, you might not be able to detect it a few hours later because it's already metabolized and out of the system. There are many additives that can be added to this, these synthetic cannabinoids that affect 
the laboratory analysis of the person's urine. Most of the data comes from emergency departments and poison control centers. So we're missing use outside those, those surveillance systems. Two systems that do exist in the United States are the US DEA National Forensic Laboratory. Just an example, in 2009, they had identified 23 cases of synthetic cannabinoid use by 2010, one year later, 41,000 cases were reported. The U.S. DAWN, that's the Drug Abuse Warning Network, also a surveillance system out of the emergency departments, uh, noted 11,000 reports in 2010 to 28,000 in 2011. Synthetic cannabinoids, patterns of use. Another system um, is the Monitoring the Future National Survey Results. And this is a longitudinal study that's been going on since 1975 until the present day, it's 2022. That's the, the most recent report looking at substance use patterns amongst young, young uh, persons, so middle school and high schoolers, and also some college students. In 2011, they were asked, students were asked about synthetic cannabinoid use in the last 12 months. And at that time in 2011, 11.4% of 12th graders had used synthetic cannabinoids in the last year, and that was second only to cannabis, almost 9% of 10th graders and 4% of 8th graders. Subsequently, there was a big drop in reported use of synthetic cannabinoids from 2013 to 2014, and then a really steady decline through 2021. In 2022, there was an uptick in synthetic cannabinoid use up to 3.2% in 12th graders, 2.2% in 10th, and 1.5% of 8th graders. From 2010 to 2014, estimates of between 6 and 17% of U.S. college students had used synthetic cannabinoids at least once. So what are some of the drivers of synthetic cannabinoid use? One, um, someone who anticipates a stronger effects versus cannabis. They, they want to feel more high or a, a bigger impact of the substance than they would from cannabis. The individual may perceive synthetic cannabinoids as less risky. In 2012, from the Monitoring the Future study, only 24 to 25% of students perceived a great risk for trying synthetic cannabinoids once. In 2022, 20% 20 of 12th graders and 26% of 10th graders and 23% of 8th graders perceived a great risk for trying synthetic cannabinoids. The thought is, well, this substance is not easily detected and it won't get caught. It's also in the past been very highly available versus cannabis in the past. Now cannabis is, is very available as well and the costs were very low. Move on to talk about synthetic cannabinoids effects. First, we'll talk about some of the acute psychological effects of synthetic cannabinoids. So after use, the early effects of synthetic cannabinoids are much like THC. However, they are much more intense and more variable. Person will experience euphoria, relaxation, maybe disinhibition, alter perception, and some mild changes in thinking, cognitive changes. And these, uh, experiences occur by the minutes after the ingestion. Some of the adverse effects acutely are unlike THC, and they will be more akin to one, one that's experienced after using stimulants or hallucinogens. These experiences may be anything from anxiety and irritability, all the way progressing to hallucinations, paranoia, and disorganization. We think that these substances, that the contaminoids, are also indirectly activating other receptors in the brain or a mixture of receptors. We're not quite sure why we see the stimulant or hallucinogen effects. There are also metabolites and these toxic byproducts that we alluded to earlier that may be creating these uh, particular experiences. There may be other substances that are co-occurring with the synthetic cannabinoids, and the person may be using other substances intentionally. There also may be drug-drug interactions. We don't know why it's having this effect. 
There are some chronic psychological effects associated with synthetic cannabinoids, and I say associated because it's, we don't know it's causing these effects, but chronic synthetic cannabinoid use is associated with the development of mental illness, in particular anxiety and mood disorders and psychotic disorders. We've also observed so the synthetic cannabinoids affect many systems of the body. They have many physical effects, and that's important for providers that are treating people who might be using synthetic cannabinoids to look out for the different systems. In this, uh, in this picture here, both the neurological and psychiatric symptoms are sort of lumped into the same box. But the psychoactive, it's important to note that the psychoactive symptoms may be transient. However, they may be much longer in vulnerable persons. And of all the body systems, the cardiac symptoms really do stand out as being the most commonly reported. And typically, tachycardia or bradycardia, that's a fast heart rate or a slow heart rate, are, are common chest pain, and then elevated blood pressure, hypertension, in one-third to three-fourths of individuals that are using. And these effects, any of these effects may last for minutes all the way to hours after use, and maybe it are, again, very variable. And just to list the systems here, we have the neurological system, the pulmonary system, which is the, are the lungs, hepatic, liver, digestive, eyes, ophthalmology, dermatological, cardiovascular, as I mentioned, renal. In particular, this um, the synthetic cannabinoids can cause a massive breakdown of muscle tissue, which can in turn clog up the kidneys and cause kidney failure. So that's, um, that's a pretty important effect to look out for. When we look at commonly reported adverse effects of synthetic cannabinoids, we are getting this information from poison control centers and hospitals. From the poison control centers, and the commonly reported symptoms include tachycardia, agitation, vomiting, paranoia, usually with a duration of less than eight hours. And most of them, most of the cases are treated in the ambulatory setting. In the hospitals, neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms were reported most commonly at 66%, followed by cardiac then rhabdomyolysis, which is a breakdown of muscle tissue, respiratory depression, and then acute kidney injury. But neuropsychiatric symptoms predominated in a hospital-based setting. In terms of serious events, there are many, um, unfortunately, there have been many episodes of serious events reported uh, in related to synthetic cannabinoid use. In the USA in 2015, there were the peak number of poison control center calls, almost 8,000, which was 229% just in the first six months of the year, 229% more than the previous year. Most reported symptoms included uh, agitation, followed by rapid heartbeat, followed by drowsiness, lethargy, vomiting, and confusions. There are many clusters of poisonings that are associated with synthetic cannabinoids. I'm, I've listed a few here, but notably in 2012 in Wyoming, there were 16 cases of acute kidney injury from a substance called SCXLR11. 2013 in Colorado, more than 200 people presented with altered mental status, hypertension, tachycardia, attributed to the synthetic cannabinoid EDB, P-I-N-A-C-A, Pinaca, in 2015 in Mississippi and the area, also included Georgia, 721 people presented with agitated delirium and 11 people died, also attributed to one of the synthetic cannabinoids. And one of the most notable clusters in 2018 Many people, 164 in total, were affected by a rat poison, which is can cause bleeding. It's an anticoagulant that was added to a synthetic cannabinoid. And in this case, seven people died and with a total of 164 affected. The people who die from synthetic cannabinoid-related events usually die because of cardiovascular events like heart attacks or strokes respiratory, blood clots, other lung complications, and then acute injury to the kidney. 
some of the fatalities may occur because of the co-occurring substances that the person uses, either causing organ failure or traumatic events. Moving on to withdrawal syndromes. There is a withdrawal syndrome that's associated with synthetic cannabinoids. It tends to occur with prolonged use of the substances. It may start several days after the, sensation, the cessation of using synthetic cannabinoids. Symptoms include restlessness, irritability, tremor, nausea, sweating, tachycardia, which is a rapid heart rate, and high blood pressure and anxiety. The treatments are supportive, usually sedatives, most commonly benzodiazepines or quetiapine. This is a study from um, 2022 published in Psychopharmacology looking at uh, synthetic cannabinoids withdrawal syndrome. And here they, the graph compares uh, synthetic cannabinoids, otherwise known again as synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists, compared to high potency herbal cannabis. So the, the synthetic cannabinoids in the red, green are the high potency herbal cannabis products, comparing the withdrawal syndrome across five measures. And in all of the measures, synthetic cannabinoids, the synthetic cannabinoids had a more intense experience. They had a faster onset of withdrawal, a shorter duration, but much more intense and faster development of tolerance. Again, from the same study in 2022, we see the correlation between the days of use and the intensity of the withdrawal syndrome across all of the, the different symptoms of withdrawal. And in the blue, the, the blue is 11 to 50 days of use in the past year. The gray, 51 to 100, and black, over 100 uh, use in the past year. And with each, um, and you see in the, in the black that the experience of withdrawal sim symptoms was greatest with the most number of uses in the past year. Diagnosis and treatment. Diagnosis and treatment related to synthetic cannabinoids. So acutely, if someone comes in intoxicated, it may be really tough to diagnose acute intoxication from synthetic cannabinoids. The substances, again, are really hard to detect and lab testing is really limited. And by the time you get back a result, it could be two weeks later. And the syndrome, the acute intoxication syndrome, may really may look like other types of acute intoxications, or it could look like an acute mental health crisis. The synthetic cannabinoid use disorder diagnosis is categorized as a cannabis use disorder at this time using the same DSM-5 criteria. Treatments, at the moment, there are no specific treatments for synthetic cannabinoid use disorder. Acutely, we use supportive care with fluids, sedatives, as I mentioned, heart medications, nausea medications, oxygen, and airway support if needed. Vulnerable populations in synthetic cannabinoids, like with other substances, there are vulnerable populations more likely to experience adverse events and more likely to use these substances. As we mentioned, the youth are particularly targeted for using synthetic cannabinoids, and they are vulnerable because they're really inexperienced, mostly in terms of substance use. They also are more likely to engage in high-risk behaviors, making the substance use more dangerous, potentially. People that have co-occurring mental health illnesses are at increased risk of developing and worsening mental health diagnoses if they use synthetic cannabinoids. Again, uh, those who are also using cannabis and have a can cannabis use disorder are the ones that are more likely to use synthetic cannabinoids. People that are homeless are vulnerable populations that are more likely to use and experience adverse effects from synthetic cannabinoids. They may be using to escape the street environment. People that are incarcerated may also be using synthetic cannabinoids. They're not easily detected, so that might be a reason to use it and just another way to escape boredom. The next two slides are going are illustrations of some qualitative research about synthetic cannabinoids. The first one is from Addiction Research and Theory, um, 
entitled the use of synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists within the homeless population, motivations, harms, and the implications for developing an appropriate response. The study took place in 2016 in the UK with 53 qualitative interviews with unhoused sub synthetic cannabinoid users. And the goal really was to understand the motivations for use and, and also to help build evidence-based responses in this particular population. And I'm gonna just talk about some of the results here, but what the themes that came out were that many people were using the substance, these substances to escape the realities of street life, to quote, spice makes this life on the streets bearable, you get me, and numbs you. Also accessible, low cost, high potency, Lack, lacking detection, avoidance, withdrawal, easier use in public were other themes. To quote, I can sit anywhere I want and blaze a spice spliff. And nobody, no policy, no, excuse me, no police or anybody can do anything because they'll never know. Identified harms from, from these interviews, in quotes, the substance is more addictive, in particular, more likely to cause death new or worsened mental health symptoms, costs, and there were many costs associated with dependence. So the, in conclusion that this, there were many services that were needed to better meet the needs of this population versus the use of synthetic cannabinoids rather than a focus on synthetic, excuse me, focus on legislative efforts. I'm gonna move into talking about harm reduction in synthetic cannabinoids. And here is the second, the other qualitative study I was referring to. This is a study published in 2019 in Drugs Alcohol Today, looking at risk management strategies of synthetic cannabinoid users. And this, this report is part of it, is a sub-study of a larger study uh, in taking place in four different cities, four groups, Galveston, Houston, New Orleans, and New York City. And the criteria for entry into the study was synthetic cannabinoid use in the last 30 days and more than once per month in the last year. And the goal of the study was to develop some insights into the harm reduction practices with the goal of strengthening new harm reduction strategies, what's called bottom-up strategies, which means incorporating strategies are already used on the street used for people, used by people and developed by people who use drugs. The study um, reported on 20 participants, two thirds of them are non-white and three fourths were male. And the themes that were notable here is that people um, who use synthetic cannabinoids had, a, had some strategies that kept them safer. So one group of strategies were purchasing strategies and this entailed developing a high awareness of the inconsistencies in the quality and composition, adulteration and substance, substitution and changes in labeling of synthetic cannabinoids. In particular, these purchasing strategies were disseminated within networks in order to keep the community safer. And this is a quote from Jay, a male 30 years old in New York City, you don't know what you're going to get in that batch. The difference is chemically. They always have to switch it because the tests are coming. Consumption strategies were another type of um, strategy developed that was protective for the, the group. And in particular, they noted that using in familiar social groups was more protective. And in that way, they could limit the quantity of the use that they were using at a time and they could space it out per sitting and they're compared uh, using in familiar social groups versus really using in unfamiliar social groups as much more protective from angel a lot of times i'll have a point which is um, a term that i hadn't known about a point is a combination of the words fake and joints um, since some users you refer to synthetic cannabinoids as fake marijuana so a lot of times I'll have a foint and you'll have a foint and Red will have a foint so you know we'll smoke mine and an hour later we'll smoke yours and an hour later we'll smoke Red's, you know? Also limiting um, the combination of synthetic cannabinoids with other substances was identified as a means to reduce risk from Reese in New Orleans, male 27. I found out if you use more with it, 
any other type of drug, it can send a shock to your body and cause you to go into a seizure and stuff like that. So you know, when I'm using Mojo, I pretty much keep it isolated from other drugs. More about harm reduction and synthetic cannabinoids. This is a flyer, a pamphlet that I found that's from Wales. So, so worldwide, this is a, is a is an issue synthetic cannabinoid use, and these are the the Welch who have developed really nice pamphlet for reducing harm associated with synthetic cannabinoids. And I in particular really liked the text here. And this harm reduction messaging really is very tailored to the type of substance that the pe people are using and to, to the people who are using the substance. I'll read some of these, these harm reduction messages. Spice is not the same as weed. A fraction of what you would use in a cannabis spliff will get you high. Start with a sprinkle smaller than the size of a match head. And here's an example. Spice has gotten stronger since the Psychoactive Substances Act. Wait, it can take up to 60 minutes to take full effect. We talked about that. Don't smoke in pipes or bongs. It's much harder to control the dose. Shake the bag. The chemicals fall to the bottom of the bag, making the strength vary throughout. Remember, we said that the, the, the substance is not evenly distributed in these packets. Use a longer roach, which is a, is a roll, it's a, it's a joint that's rolled up. Use a longer roach than you normally would have smoking weed. Use with other drugs, cannabis, alcohol, or stimulants can cause heart problems. It can also increase anxiety and paranoia. Use in a safe environment with people you trust. Again, from that other study, Users with heart circulatory or blood pressure problems should avoid the use of synthetic cannabinoids as they may be more susceptible to heart attacks. So these are really meaningful messages from, from the Welch, from the substance uh, uh, about synthetic cannabinoids and great harm reduction messages that are based on a lot of the, the science that we discussed so far. I'm going to conclude here by just these um, reading the slide, synthetic cannabinoids were developed to mimic the action of THC at the cannabinoid receptors. The synthetic cannabinoids are much more potent as full agonists than THC or cannabis. The effects of synthetic cannabinoids are much more pronounced, unpredictable, affecting multiple body systems versus the cannabis. And vulnerable persons are uniquely at risk for adverse events. These synthetic cannabinoids are constantly evolving and they are not regulated with variability in its content, including the presence of other substances, poisons, and unknowns. And there are many harm reduction protective strategies that really do exist for people who use synthetic cannabinoids or might be more likely to use synthetic cannabinoids that we should be promoting. Here's a list of some references where you can find more information. And feel free to contact me at this email address if you have any further questions or would like help with resources. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Munn for today's program. I hope you will all find it useful while assisting clients in need of services. Your feedback is important to us. It helps us to know if we're meeting your educational goals and expectations. Once you have viewed the presentation in its entirety and completed the quiz, if prompted, please follow directions to access the SurveyMonkey website and take a moment to complete the evaluation. Once again, thank you for joining us and keep up the good work.